On n'attend pas le feu vert, mais vu l'heure, on va y aller. OK. Uh, so, uh, my name is Hugues Aubin, and I'm working for uh, Rennes Metropolitan Area in the field of uh, information and communication technology. And um, I'm also one of the co-founders of the local Fab Lab, uh, Fabrication Laboratory, uh, which is a uh, no, very interesting project of the territory uh, that we named the Extended uh, Fab Lab. Um, today, I'm very honored to be here to welcome you because um, I was called by Stefan Ribas of INRIA, and uh, he told me, um, we are going to Ren. And I told him, um, I know your feel about openness, and uh, um, now there is something very important for us. Uh, it's an uh, open hardware ecosystem. And um, now we really think, uh, as Elvis Presley, it's now or never. So um, we all know um, what is the bazaar and what is the cathedral. Um, in, the, um, in the bazaar, we are all iterating, we are publishing quick, we are <coughs> correcting bugs together, and we are uh, using things immediately. Uh, what is uh, very interesting was that I'm not a developer. I was a professional webmaster of 14 years at the beginning of the web. So I was used to learn myself HTML, JavaScript, PHP, MySQL, Apache, and so on. And one day, about five years before, as many people, not engineers, I had this thing in the end, Arduino card. But it was something very strange because I, I, I said, what, what is it? What is this? And somebody told me, for an engineer, it's almost nothing because, you know, you can put all of this in one millimeter. So why making this? Why putting the electronic plants of this? For another reason, than technological performance. For the people to be able to make things with it, to make, to transform immediately code, lines of codes, in use cases. This is specifically something very interesting to imagine that you put something that is made to make anything. So I brought back this thing at home I put this with a USB cable on my computer, and whoa, let's, let's blinking. Sounds spreading. So I went on the web, and I saw boxes, I saw sensors, I saw data bases, and I saw almost perhaps 10,000 of objects I could make at home and I could iterate. It was a great discovery. Now, many, many people know this little tool, which can be a metaphor. Yesterday, Bernard Lieter, he told us, you should think about efficiency and resilience. You should think about diversity and interconnectivity. This is not efficient, technically. This is very interesting in the field of diversity and interconnectivity. We had this, around this, we have drones, we have 3D printers, we have DNA decoders, we have many, many things. And now we have almost many scales. Let's take for the example of the scale of the people who can't afford solutions, or let's take the case of the world of today. Do you think that now, in the 21st century, we have the solutions for everybody? Perhaps we have the solutions. Who can afford them? Everybody is happy on planet Earth? You think it's only the problem of the, pay of the South countries? We have the problem here, in Rain, in France, and we must find solutions. Some solutions are here and people are using them. 
Many solutions must be found. Some solutions are found, but the people who need them can't afford them. The place where I saw the most people, not engineers, using open source software was in Dakar and in Bamako. Everybody, everybody was using open source softwares for economic reasons. Now, what is very interesting is that the lines of codes are not only computing tools. It's not only things that we are compiling to put on, on the cloud or on computers to make big things work in centralized models. No. Now we are uploading chairs. We are downloading machines. We are iterating machines. Machines are making other things. And we have a scalable, um, a scalable ecosystem growing very fast around open source hardware. Let's take some little examples. Um, for example, let's take um, Bionico, Nicolas Huchet project. Is this professional? It looks efficient? No. How does it cost? 100 euros? No, about 800 organisms and associations are working around openprosthetics.com. They are not making code for code. They are using things to make work their muscular, to make work prosthetics, and the cost of these prosthetics are around $30,000 for one hand. 80 people who have a hand missing are in the source countries. With this, we take muscular signals with open source sensors, with Arduino, with 3D model, open source, made by Gaël Langevin, which is giving a conference this morning. And we prove to the people why it could work. So people, what are, what are they doing? They are doing what you do with code, but with 3D models, with electronic schemes. And what happens is objects around the planet. For example, this one. One year before, now working in Bombay in one month, in January. One thousand, uh, 100 euro more. Um, it works really. You can take things. You can drive it with muscles. But you can also download it and you can make it if you buy some modelism motors around you. It's a very little scale. Who is concerned? Perhaps one per one million, one per 10,000 people, but how many little communities are needing this kind of solutions for other things as disabled people? Many, many, many people. What is very interesting is that it works, really works. And what is very interesting is that you can have many very, very simple schemes, very simple code. But this code is immediately in the end of the people if we have tools of a process chain. So, that's the principle, of, for example, of the fabrication laboratories. It's something like a factory to make anything and optimize to make anything. So the sense only spreads when you've, you know what you are making with it. So let's take, this is low tech. This is nothing. It means that for the industry, oh, perhaps it's, it's not clean. Perhaps it's not strong enough, but it works. I've got a hand who works, and it's $300, not $30,000. Let's take another low-tech example. This is 19th century, stenotype, the ancestor of the, uh, of the picture. You know, you see, it's a thing to take pictures. This is just a paradox. 
you can download it, you can print it, you put the thing inside and you take pictures. Nothing technological, nothing. But you know, with this, thousand people are now reading on the web, they can do this kind of thing and they know how to click, take pictures. So they go to the hackerspace and fab labs around them and they say, oh, I've got the files. How can I do this, make this? And they say, we are not making this for you, you are making it. But, oh, and they are discovering something. Not this, but open source ecosystem. Why? Tangible things are democratic. People are coming from objects to the ecosystem and they are understanding. They can build together, iterate, and we are now having many, many people asking questions about license, about patents, about iterations, trying to find solutions, and wanting to learn how to code because they are just feel, felt, touched, simple things. So what could openness mean if the door is at the top of a huge, huge mountain? Are you concerned in changing things, shaking things, moving the world, finding solutions, making hybridation between the model of the cathedral and the model of the bazaar? If you want to make that, to do that, you must put doors everywhere. Or you must not have to wall, no walls. So there is something very important for me, is that you can have great things technically, but you won't change anything if you don't want the people to discover what it does mean. So it's what we are doing here. Two other examples. We are here at small scales. Let's take this. <coughs> I'm working for a territory. Now everybody is saying, okay, we are going to the intelligent city. Intelligent city is a city with uh, sensors. Sensors are pushing data. Data is managing machines, is managing everything that can open, close door, manage traffic, uh, environmental things, and so on. But where are the people? Do they understand what is taking place around them? Do they understand it? Can they reprogram it? Can we use open source in other fields than the field of the one little community? It seems that yes. We have no open source vehicles, open source DNA decoders. We have also open source methodologies. We have open source um, documents. For example, when the Britannia region open a fab lab in a school, it means that the director of the school he has something that legally makes it possible that the people, if they hurt themselves with a soldering iron, is not at the justice court. For this, you've got in France a great grammary. If you one time make this grammary in one place and you put in Creative Commons the documents, all the schools in France can open Fab Labs. So it's not a question of code only. For example, <coughs> this is something you will see this afternoon at uh, 3rd p.m. It's just another Arduino shield. This Arduino shield is made by a local society named us We Six Labs. It's just a brick. This brick makes able to have an open source tool chain that concern all the uh, sensors or object data being exchanged using um, low um, um, low power uh, and long range antennas. It's very interesting to see that now you've got phone operators 
that offer solutions for the, for the industries to take this data and manage this data on big cities. After that, you've got solutions that some companies pushed not to pay these phone operators, for example, Sigfox. All of this proprietary. What is very funny is when you have academics developing software, open source software, making able for thousands and thousands of sensors of whole cities to exchange, push in the cloud, between them, in many um, forms of networks, data that you've got cities wanted to try these open source solutions, for example, of public buildings, for energy monitoring, and that when you want to be concrete, you've got companies making open source hardware here in France that anybody could put on an Arduino to make it work, and that when you, you want to test it, you've got the local Fab Lab who say, okay, People are always taking Arduinos, are taking 3D printers, are taking laser cutters, are taking sensors to, to make about 15 objects in rain. How to test it? Very simple. Give us 20 shields and the people are making anything with it using the library we are developing together. It means that you have not only the cathedral you are not only the bazaar. You can have academic working with companies, working with cities, trying with people, but with things really working. So yesterday, Ben Arlieta told to us, open source is in, and the patriarchal model is young. But he told us something else, diversity is something very important to get resilience. And this resilience is a strategic, strategic goal now for the cities and territories. You know the stories of Kodak in Rochester? Kodak closed, Rochester is dead. So it means something else for me. We are not here to say no patents, no academics, hackers revolution. Or oh, academics is serious, patents are serious. No. What we must find is the way to bring diversity, to push the new way we can find solutions for everybody using everything we have. And what we have now is sometimes places, factories, brands, learning, and tools. And what is very strong is where the tools are open, when you've got something to push, share, 3D models, it's not 3D models. It's an object I can, I can have in the end about two or five hours after. When I can, with any, um, any software, bring to you in New York a chair, just putting DEXF models, it's concrete. So now I think that today you will see people, not academics, bringing their machines, their do-it-yourself rep wraps, their open source softwares, with high developers, with little scale projects, with big scale projects launched. And what we want you is to have fun and share with them your knowledge to build things we can capitalize, because like Elvis Presley said, it's now or never. Thank you for your attention.